Hey, everybody. Who's here? This is Via Williams. I've got Ben Kinney and Bob Stewart, and we are so excited for another leadership mentoring webinar today. If you guys can hear us, let us know. Yeah, throw something into the chat box for us and make sure our audio is okay. This is our test, test, test section. Whoa, if you're in there, just tell us where you're from. Maybe what you do, that kind of thing, you know. Jen Lampy's from downstairs. Oh, Jen, you're so close. So close. <laughs> we, we got, got Spokane Shea, and North Carolina. Atlanta, Detroit, Lexington, Kentucky. Wow. Wow, that's pretty cool. Bree from Brivity. Christy from Seattle. Hey, Grand Rapids. This is fun. I could just do this all day. It's like a ticker tape. Yeah. Lally, I think you might be in uh, China right now. Uh, awesome. Cool. Sounds like everybody hears us. Um, Via, why, why don't you start by just telling us, tell everybody what, what are we going to talk about today? Yeah, so this is the webinar that you guys have all been asking for. This is, um, today's the big one, uh, in my opinion. Today, we're going to devote the whole entire session to emotional intelligence. And EI is something that, that Ben uh, taught me, I don't know what, Ben, two, a couple years ago. And he sent, me, um, he sent me a link and he said, you've got to read this book. I think I was at the airport. It was the Harvard Business Review um, book that we gave you guys. And um, I was like, are you trying to tell me something? It's like giving someone mints, you know, and basically telling them they have bad breath, right? So he's like, no, it's a game changer and it's incredible. And for whatever reason, within like an hour of him sending me the link, I had read, you know, a portion of that book. Sometimes it was just, you get things at the right time. And I would say in my, I've had a, a massive transformation over the last two years. And I, if I had to give one concept the most credit, it would be this. It's that big of a deal to me. How did you get turned on to that, Ben? I mean, what kind of brought you into this phase of your journey before we launch in? You know, uh, I like, like UV, I spent a lot of time in airports and hotels and <laughs> I was sitting in the SeaTac airport and I was looking at books on the wall and I always take pictures of where the one thing is and I send it to Jay and books that my other friends have written and stuff. And, and I see this, this wall of uh, uh, Harvard Business Review um, books and they, they're really just collections of Harvard studies and Harvard articles uh, all arranged around a single subject. And I'm looking and there's like a customer success one and there's a managing and leading one and there's this blue one and I love the color blue. It must've like attracted my <laughs> eyes. And I like, I zoom into this, into this emotional intelligence and I open up the first page and uh, I just start reading. And as I went through the description of what emotional intelligence was, I went back to all the failures I've had in my career and in my business. And I thought the, the, the times that I failed as a leader I had low emotional intelligence. As I continue to fail, that's, that's my issue. And it, it was really a life-changing subject because it narrows down into these five areas what we could do to become a, a better leader of ourselves and, and of others. And as we talk about in our leadership triangle, that, that also allows us to grow more leaders. And I think individuals are attracted to people with a high emotional intelligence. 100%. And I think that what's especially cool about this topic for our particular group is that while this group is open to anybody in any industry, right, a large majority of the people that are actively participating in our program are in the real estate industry. And a lot of them are real estate agents and own businesses. And that personality profile lends itself to a very passionate, high volatility uh, type of a behavior, right? It, it, it's definitely, this is not probably a group filled with accountants who have, a, you know, likely a strong uh, level of emotional regulation and, and a lot of this stuff. And, and the other thing, Ben, is that our asset, when, when we're in the industry, we're in our asset as people, isn't it? We, we don't, it's not widgets. I mean, you have tech certainly in the real estate space and in a lot of our space, our asset is our people. So when we, you know, invest time in R and D, it really probably should be on EI, right? Because if we're R and Ding and we're studying and we're, we're working on what our number one asset is, it better be people. Right. 
Absolutely. I, I know that, uh, you know, IQ is our intelligence, but I have a lot of extremely intelligent friends that can never build anything of value. They are not successful, but they're smart. I would pick them for Trivial Pursuit every single day, right? They'd be my, my Scrabble buddy, right? I would take them onto Jeopardy with me, but they, they can't build a business because it takes more than just a high IQ. It, it takes emotional intelligence. It, it is, right. it, it's, it's our ability via, let's just read the definition. I'm gonna share my screen real quick. Before we jump into the content, after you read the definition, I wanna tell one story before we launch in, Ben. Sure. You want me to tell it now while you're pulling yeah. it up? Yeah, go ahead. So I um, went out to, um, thank you, Lisa Marie. I just got a text that said great blouse. <laughs> okay. Um, I went to lunch with clients and I had sold their really, really high-end home in Fall City, Washington for all you Seattle people. And we, we just, we ended up getting along really great. And so for my closing gift to them, I t we ended up going on a three-hour lunch. And they were highly successful CEO consultants. And what they did is they flew around the country and they were sort of a hybrid personal coach and psychologist. And they coached, I can't share with you who all they coached because they shared some of them in confidence and they had NDAs. Very, very well-known CEOs. It was a fascinating um, thing for me. So I picked their brain at lunch. And, and as I was, I was drilling that, cause I want to run a company someday. And so this is, I was, you know, I had two hours with these people in front of me. And so I was grilling them on CEOs and I was like, and I was trying to understand like, what's a really successful CEO. And I said, are they practitioners? Are they kind of tactician guys? Are they kind of dry? Are they, are they kind of analyst types or are the really successful CEOs charismatic and, you know, um, uh, you know, big personalities. And they said, you know, 80 to 90% of CEOs of, you know, successful companies throughout the United States are just really dry practitioners, right? They, they found something, they started their company and they grew it. And they, they were very um, into the analytics of it and, and of the practitioner part of it. And they said, but then you get that 10 or 20% who can do that and who understands the people part of it and those are the ones that are in the news. Those are the ones that you hear about. Those are the ones that, um, you know, Lee Iacocca <laughs> and, and, you know, Elon Musk or, you know, that's a little debatable, but the really, really big CEOs that, that take their companies to new heights have both and very rarely do, do CEOs have both. And by the way, you can get to a certain point without EI and you're always going to hit a ceiling in my, in my opinion. So that's my story. Hmm. That makes sense. That story reminds me a little bit of the Captain Class book. And you, mm -hmm. when you think about Sam Walker's book, Captain Class, you, you think that all those people on, on the court field, so to speak, right, they had high emotional intelligence. And you'll see the, how, how it kind of um, rolls together today. So uh, you guys should all be, all be seeing my screen. Is it coming up right? Yeah, and, and you guys, as always today, um, if you have any questions, um, Bob always um, does a great job monitoring questions and comments and chat and Q&A and, and breaks in and, and asks them from Ben and I. So feel free to, to do that as we're talking if you want clarification or you want to ask questions. Yeah, Ben, we can see it. Awesome. So emotional intelligence, the ability of a leader to recognize their own emotions and those of others discern between different feelings and label them appropriately, the use of emotional information to guide thinking and behavior and to adjust emotions to adapt to environments to achieve one's goal. Emotional intelligence. In the HBR book that I read, it said that when they studied businesses, the, the businesses with, with high emotional intelligence outperform the other businesses by over 70%. With that, that was the only thing they could, they could figure out that was different by, by 70%. So that definition, uh, it's a little loose, but it'll make sense. It's really the combination of, of five traits. And let's just go through these via and 
and uh, talk through each one of them and, and chime in if you guys have questions or thoughts or, or comments or, or Bob, if you want to um, lead any part of that. But Via, what is, what is self-awareness? Yeah, so, and, and Ben, I also want to stress as I, I'll, I'll read self-awareness. Um, this is from an institutional standpoint and a personal standpoint. So what, what Ben's referring to is the HBR book that I asked you guys to read. There's articles in there talking about institutional EI, fair process, right? Um, uh, trust and, you know, uh, functional teams, right? And, and then it's also personal to, to us that we're talking about. So self-awareness is, um, ooh, your little Brady Bunch squares are blocking it. Self-awareness is knowing one's strengths, weaknesses, drives, values, and impact on others. Knowing one's, your own, mm -hmm. strengths, weaknesses, drives, values. And if you guys are taking notes, do me a favor, underline impact on others. Self-awareness is, is about us knowing what are we good at? What are we bad at? What drives us personally? What are our values? And how do all of those things impact others? Emotional intelligence would tell us that even though we're really good at something, that if we don't understand its impact on other people, we're failing as a leader. A good example is I had somebody the other day, literally yesterday morning, she said, I know, I know that you're a really high D and, and the person you're working with is a really high D and I, and I get that. And I said, you have to understand that being a high D is never an excuse for, for being a, a, a jerk, right? It's never an excuse for being an asshole. It, it is actually a lack of emotional intelligence that leads highly driven uh, individuals to not care about other people. I am a very impatient, highly driven, want to go fast, want results now person. But I, but I have to understand also, if I want to retain my people, I can't burn them out. And I have to make sure that, that my drive for success and for going further, right, doesn't impact their ability to do the job that they got to do today. What's going through your head, Bia? Yeah, a lot. So, you know, a couple things that I want everybody to be aware of. <laughs> and that is that you can be a highly self-aware person and screw up. So we all have situations. Um, I've had one recently where, um, you know, either we, we willfully suspend it. We're either very self-aware and we're going to ignore it because we're going to let an emotion override it, which we're going to talk about in a minute emotional regulation or, or we, we don't, I would say our impact on others for all of you uh, here listening. Um, I want you to listen up. <laughs> if you are leading a team, do not exist in a vacuum and in a state of false humility, like I did and assume that your behaviors don't impact your team. You know, I, I, I used to not think I was that important and I would kind of belittle myself like, Oh, it doesn't really, I'm not that important. It doesn't really matter what I think. And it matters to your people. You have a bigger impact on your people than you probably realize. And you know, I, I cannot stress it enough that, that it's, it's not an unhealthy ego it's, it's just an awareness of, of, of this, what you can bring to a situation, right? Your words of approval, your words of affirmation probably mean more than you think, and the opposite is probably true. And Ben, I know you must have stuff to add on that. Well, I know that, I know that when you were going through some of those growth stages in your, in your businesses, I, I remember saying this to you, and I just remember it because I've used it many times, but you're the first one I said it to. I said, via every ship needs a captain. Mm -hmm. And when we get these other opportunities that are, that are coming towards us in life, go speak or teach or coach or do all these other million things that, that come at us, invest in this and do that and flip that and all those sort of things, right? We get distracted and then we leave the ship that, that was the thing that got us there and everybody starts looking around and they say, well, where's the captain? And without a captain, the boat goes in circles or it goes nowhere, right? And you have to understand that your strength and your drive for success and your drive for all these things can also have that negative impact on people. Now, there, yeah. there, there is no strength that we have that is not also a weakness in some capacity. A high, highly patient person 
is it's a strength. And, and because of that, they're able to get through things that others aren't. A highly impatient person is also a strength. The question is, is how does those strengths impact other people? Yeah. Because they're also a weakness. If that makes sense. Yeah, yeah, it really does. And, you know, and we'll move on. I, I think that I, I, you know, one thing to remember is I actually pride myself on being extremely self-aware. I, I used to joke around for years before I even knew what EI was. I used to joke if I, I am nothing but self-aware and I still maintain that, that I'm probably more self-aware than most. And that's not, that doesn't mean that in every situation I am. And so we can't let ourselves off the hook, right? We can't define ourselves as, you know, a lot of you watching are like, I can skip this one out of five. I, I got this one. Cause I think the old VM might've skipped this a little bit. Like I am super self-aware cause I am. I, and, I, and, and every situation's different. That's all. I, I think it comes via, here, here's something for you guys on the call to think about. Self-awareness comes by scheduling time to be aware. So when you get done with a good appointment or you get done with an a, 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 a argument with a staff or a coaching session or a big meeting or you, even you get done with your day, schedule five minutes and just say, well, how'd that go? What could I have done better? Did I talk too much? Did I get the message across? Did I stay on track? Am I being aware, right? And you ask that question and then you take some time to, to make improvement. Because if you're, you're busy going, 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 you end up thinking, right, that you're awesome all time or you miss the little tiny cues. So you have to schedule time to be self-aware and then you have to ask for feedback. You have to be willing as a leader to go out and say, hey, look, how am I doing? What could I have done better in that session? And if you don't give your people permission so that they, they aren't afraid of you, they will never share. And I've seen leaders of massive companies lead the whole world. And then when they're gone, everybody looks up and said, hey, nobody liked that guy. Nobody liked that girl, right? It's because they, everybody was so afraid to share what they thought of that person. They allowed that behavior to go on. And all those people that leave these companies are actually good people. If they would have stopped and got that feedback and got themselves off that pedestal, Maybe they could have made some changes that would have helped them in our career. And we don't want to be that person. So we got to sit down and say, how am I winning and how am I losing? What did I do wrong? And uh, a good example would be, you know, I, I shared this at Win May Give. Uh, David, David Wiggs came into my office and he said, hey, I just want you to know that, that yesterday you were not the person that, that I came to work for that yesterday, that was not the bend that, that I look forward to seeing every single day. And I think you did wrong to that person. And I sat back and I thought, you know what, David, you're right. You're right. And I called that person in my office right away. And I said, Hey, I screwed up yesterday. Can I, can I explain why? And more importantly, can I apologize? Are, are we good? And because we give our people uh, permission to do that, I can become aware of my actions and how they impact the people in my organization. But that particular employee was afraid to say anything to me because he didn't feel like he had permission to say that. But my peers, because they, they don't have a direct relationship with me, but my peers, the ones that work very closely with me via Bob, Josiah, David, Ross, you know, all, all, all these people, when I screw up, they say it right to my face right away, right? Or they send me an angry text. Uh, however that might be because they feel permission that they can do that. So I want to ask you guys that question. Are you guys giving your people permission to help you become self-aware or not? Well, yeah. And, and before we move into self-regulation, Ben, I just, I want to emphasize that. Are you hiring people who are going to do that for you? I think that I watched Ben, you know, from the beginning of his journey to now, I think he's hiring different people. I think he's more up to the, if we're being honest, you're more up to the, um, I mean, it's, it's hard. It's really hard to get that feedback, I think, you know, and, and, and I, you, you know, when you hire certain people, there's just a, a knowingness that that's going to happen. Do we have a question, Bob? Well, one, Wes brought up a point. He says, our actions, are, our actions and our words impact others. 
he said something here, not acting or speaking because we don't know what to say is acceptable. And it was based on something Ben said a minute ago. Ben, you do this to, to all of us on your team a lot, uh, where we ask you a question and we expect an answer, right? But you have enough like self-awareness to realize maybe I don't know the answer for this thing right now. And you're willing to punt things, to, to give yourself some time to research, give yourself some time to think. Um, and, and for a lot of us, that kind of, we're like, oh, I wish you just answer, right? But um, it's okay that you don't always have the answer as the leader, right? And so having that self-awareness to say, I don't want to answer this question right now. Like, this is not going to wreck our business if we don't have this answer. Let's spend a little bit more time thinking about that. So I just wanted to echo Wes's point. Yeah, I love, us a lot. I love that he says that because uh, not knowing what to say is acceptable. But what he, what he ended with is not improving the next time. Hmm is not acceptable, yeah. right? That, I was, a uh, friend of mine messaged me on, um, around Easter and said, how is it that Christians can just ask for forgiveness uh, every time they sin? And that was the perception that they had of how Christianity works. And I know this is not a faith-based call, but I'm a faith-based person, so suck it. And, <laughs> My, my answer was, it was the Bible and, and God does not give us permission to do the same sin every single time. What it says is, if you, if you wholly ask for forgiveness, right, you shall be forgiven. But if you, do, if you continue to do it, you're not really asking for forgiveness. And that was a big aha as I researched and read that because I wanted to make an intelligent response to my friend. Uh, those who habitually do the same thing over and over again are not really sorry. Interesting, huh? Well, there's no repentance if you do that. So if there, you have to have a repentance part of that cycle. I if think. you walk into a meeting every day and you say, hey, sorry, I'm late, you're not freaking sorry that you're late. You have decided that your time is more valuable than everybody else's. That's right. That makes sense? Yeah. A lot of times you haven't even consciously made that decision. You're just making that decision for everybody else to see, right? You're, you're not self-aware. You're not self-aware, so you don't know that your actions are actually making that decision. Yeah. yeah. Self-regulation. Yeah, what, what's that? Self-regulation is, um, I think, probably one of the most important concepts we're going to talk about today for this group. Uh, it's controlling or redirecting disruptive impulses and moods. So, so if you're going to just take some notes real quick here. Self-regulation is self-control. It's trust, trustworthiness. It's how conscientious you are. It's how adaptable you are. It's, it's how you can innovate and change. Self-regulation is understanding. This is how I normally react. And what is the model system plan thing that I could do to stop that from happening in the future? Triggers. You're talking about triggers. Yeah, it's, it's understanding first, hey, hey, how am I impacting others? Mm -hmm. Now, if you decide that you actually care enough to do something about it, that's where self-regulation comes in. And you get to decide, are you actually going to put a plan, a system, a model, or a thing in place to make sure it doesn't happen again? For me, sometimes, Bob, it's me not responding. Yeah. It's, 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 I know that I am very quick to answer, but it doesn't mean that my first answer is always right. And sometimes my people, what they hear is they hear my idea as a demand, a command, a model, a system, or a directive. But sometimes I'm just firing off ideas. And then they go off and they're like, hey, I just did that. I'm like, well, why'd you do that? And they said, well, it was your idea. It was just an idea. I thought we'd talk about it some more. That makes sense. I had a, Ben, you know, you sent an article out. You might have shared it somewhere. And it was about the, I think it was the Inuit people and how they've kind of eliminated anger from, from their um, society. And I, we were talking about triggers. I, I have young kids and the oldest one, he's three. He'll slap me in the face every once in a while. And like, 
that article and this idea of self-regulation, like I've just had to put this little model in place, right? It's just a, a simple model. When he hits me, I have to, I force myself to take one deep breath. And then I force myself right into that Inuit model. I, I'm not like, why did you hit me? I say, that hurt daddy. Okay. And just those two things have allowed me to like, not just snap and react to him, right? That self-regulation with my kid, who's really the most important thing in, in, in my wife and I's world. But just that, that simple model. Uh, Bob, what, what, what stood out to me in that article was, and I, we posted in the leadership group, for those of you guys that want to read it, was they understood that how they responded to their children would be how their children would respond going forward. So you, you think about somebody that yells and snaps and swears and has a short temper, right? And, and then you see how they demonstrate that for their children. And then their children behave that way in school. And then they're all frustrated, mad with the temper and swearing about their kids. But they're the ones that taught them how to do it. Yeah. In, in business, it's no different. You, you think that you don't walk into an organization and all of a sudden you realize everybody in that, in that room is rude or everybody in that rude is, room is, uh, is crooked or, or whatever that might be. It started at the top. It's because that leader created that culture and they couldn't regulate their own behaviors. Uh huh. Self-regulation, controlling or redirecting disruptive impulses and moods. Uh, let's just think about some, some of those things. Uh, as I said, answering too quickly. Responding when your heart rate is up or when you're angry. Sometimes what you gotta do is just take a walk. Could we pick this up tomorrow morning? Could, could I get back to you in five or 10 minutes? Just sit there, say, I need to think about this for a second. Will you give me a second? And you just take a second and you, and you breathe and you get control and you think, hey, I, I know that if I don't do this right, I'm gonna respond emotionally. Somebody at one of these events that I did recently, they said, what, what we learned to do is when my wife comes to me with a list of her concerns, I was always objecting to what they said or what she said and arguing, and it wasn't getting us anywhere. So now what I did is I keep a notepad in my pocket, and when she has a concern, I take it out, and I just take notes exactly what she says. And you'll notice if, you, if, if we ever go through a resentment circle uh, exercise on one of these webinars, you'll notice that as we go through these resentment circle exercises, I'll do the same exact thing. I won't respond. I'll just write notes. All right. Well, what are you concerned about? What are our issues? Tell me more about that. Why do you think that bothers you? And I'll let them get everything out. And that calms me down and allows me to think about what my response would be. Then at the end, I respond. That's self-regulation. It's me not responding until I've heard everything out. Okay, Ben, we're going to talk about this one. So here's the deal. The one of the best nicknames I've heard for Ben Kinney, my brother dubbed, and he calls Ben the Chuck Norris of real estate, which I think is so perfect. <laughs> <laughs> because for all of you who know Ben or know the persona of Ben, he is a very, very emotionally regulated guy. Probably, probably a unicorn about it. So while I, what I, I have questions for you, Ben. So one of my questions is, is are you the Chuck Norris of real estate because you've mastered self-regulation or is this just something that's come naturally to you from the get-go? Uh, what are we seeing? Are we seeing a product of your, uh, is this a skill or an innate trait? Sorry, we didn't rehearse this. No, no, uh, we never rehearse anything, number one. Well, that's uh, actually, that's very true. I'm probably the Chuck Norris of real estate because of my large firearm collection. <laughs> but the, I'll, I'll tell you a story. Um, I grew up angry. I grew up every night where I would pray for my parents to stop drinking, smoking, doing drugs, to stop fighting, to not have financial problems. I grew up with my mom drunk and my stepdad drunk and, and, and them fighting back and forth. And there was a point at the end of 
my high school career where I got in an altercation with my stepfather. And at that moment, I could have killed him. I was so angry. I was seeing white and red. And, and uh, I remember, because I, I moved out basically the next day, as I said to myself, I am not going to lose control again. There was probably two or three months prior to that, I was in the high school parking lot and somebody threw a water balloon at me and then drove off. I literally ran across the parking lot, across the street, and I punched the guy's window out. I was such an angry, messed up kid that I had zero control after I lost, after I went past a certain point. There's a point in that situation where the things that come out of my mouth and the things that I do are not me. And I made a decision at that point that I was not going to get angry again. And you'll ask Aaron or any of my people, they'll tell you on one hand the number of times they could visibly see me angry. Yeah, that's, yeah, never. I mean, I mean, I can tell when you're angry, but it's, no. Yeah, I can tell, but I, I've yeah. never seen you. No. I've never seen that emotion, like, come across to you. So, so I struggle. So I'm going to, you know, for we pro, you and I promised our, our group that we'd be raw in this, right? So I struggle a little bit. 25 year mastery of emotional regulation. It, I, because I struggle with this and you know what you guys, you do too, because I manage and lead you. <laughs> and, and I mean, this is, this is the number one out of all of them. We all struggle with this. It, you know, you're, you're the rare person if you don't. Right. So, you know, I can share with you some hacks that, that work for me I think Ben, it's such a great role model for all of us because that, that is, that is a, it's since high school, Ben, you're it's 20, 25 year mastery, which gives all of us hope. I mean, that's, 20, that's just, just to be clear via 21 and a half years, like you don't need to round up. Thanks. <laughs> I'm trying to do the math. I, okay. 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 Um, we're going to move on on that. But, but one of the things, um, one of my little um, sayings that I have is I don't have good impulse control. So I am really good at controlling my environment. You know, that, that's one of, one of a thought I'd like to plant with you. So what that looks like for me is I am better off taking a step back and, and you know, uh, talking, Ben talked about it, not responding it, for me, ghosting is sometimes a better tactic for me, right? In fact, I, I, if I'm ghosting you on a response, it's either because I don't know the answer or I'm busy or I've decided that a non-response is going to be better than an, you know, probably an angry one. So that's one thing is you can think about controlling your environment if you don't have impulse control yet. As I get better at my impulse, impulse control, which I am, I work hard on that. Um, one of the things that I remind myself a lot these days is we can control our second thought. We can't control our first thought. We just cannot typically control. I think Ben probably can control his first thought. He's that, but most of us can't control our first thought. So the question is like, like Bob was describing with his kid, right? The very first initial millisecond, like you, you just get pissed when someone hits you, right? It's just kind of a natural reaction. And Bob's just learning to control his second thought, which is, you know, I'm going to stay calm, right? He has a self-talk around it. I, I, those are two hacks. My third hack is, um, I'm getting a lot better at, um, I do autopsies now. I, I've been working on this for probably five years, I would say, specifically self-regulation and emotional regulation. But I do autopsies after almost every meeting like Ben was describing and certainly after every day. The notes on my phone is my journal. And I had a, uh, a fail last week and um, I have five lessons written down uh, of where my DNA was in it. Uh, it wasn't all my DNA in, in the situation I'm thinking of, but I, I, I started saying, okay, but what was the trigger? And so the more we can recognize what is going to trigger us, you know, we can, we can either step away in a preemptive strike or we can understand and prepare ourselves for that reaction ahead of time. So those are my three things I was just going to add to that. So I'd say via, uh, in high school, I was a wrestler and, uh, our coach would sit us down knee to knee and he'd say, all right, uh, 
slap your partner in the face. So we'd go like this and we'd slap in the face and the next guy would go like this. And every once in a while it would pick up a little bit more momentum. And then pretty soon by the end of the end of the exercise, we were reaching in our back pocket and like knocking the guy over and it starts up small and it builds up and builds up and your response, just like your, your voice over somebody picks up, picks up, picks up. You have to figure out when are you being triggered and then be willing to stop right there and walk away. So it's not that I don't get mad. It's that I have more understanding of when I'm going down that path. Mm, okay. and, I, and I'm willing to walk away because I know what happens later for me. We all know where that point – I mean, I think anybody, anybody who has that self-awareness, you know where that point is, right? That point where you're like you're getting there and you're about to pass. I mean, you've you got to recognize that. Yeah, I think, I think in a relationship you say, hey – I love you. Good night. I, I think in, in business, uh, when I know that it's going to go down a bad path, uh, V and Bob can tell you, I'll just send you a smiley face. If you guys send something to me that makes me mad and I know that my response the next time is not going to be kind, I'll just send you a smiley face. It's my way of just saying, all right, I'm going to walk away from this thing. And I let them calm down. And then we can both go back down to that level of emotion where we can, we can talk through this. And if that takes a day or a night, right, I'm willing to wait that out because I know when I'm being triggered and when I'm not being triggered. Yeah, Brandon asked a really good question. He said, via as a leader, when you make the decision to ghost someone, do you make your reason for doing so known to them? Uh, no, uh, if I'm, if I'm taking a break from responding, Brandon, um, I'm take, I need to take a break from responding. It's not very common. It's pretty unusual. I, I mean, I'm pretty heated at that point, right? Usually for me, it's very quick. I, I don't hold on. Uh, I'm, I'm, I'm wired to be a naturally uh, happy person actually. And, um, so it usually snaps back fairly quick for me. Uh, the long ones, it is, it is uh, when I'm ready to come around, I come around. I don't know another way to answer that. Makes sense. Marsha has a really smart comment. She says they have a coach that recently had them rewrite the story around their thoughts. So instead of allowing their emotions to control that thought, which might have happened in the moment, after it, they step back and they're going to rewrite the story around their thoughts. Like, why did they feel that way? What forced them into that? What was the trigger? Right. Um, but it allows them to kind of step back afterwards. And like you said, via do that autopsy on that thing that happened. Right. And say, mm -hmm. all right, how could I have, how could, how could my thoughts have been different or how could they be different the next time? Right. Cause that's really what we're preparing for is what is that? We're going to, that same thing is going to happen to us again. Yeah. Here's a, here's an addition that you guys would do to that for my two married friends on the, on the call here, but also in business. And you'll see it via the, because Via and I got to role play some exercises in front of our, our group called the master class. It's a, it's a coaching group where we meet four times a year for two days straight. Um, it's a massive amount of time, but we spent about 80 hours compared to a coaching relationship spends about 40 hours. We spent 80 hours together. So Via and I got to, got to role play this, this resentment circle exercise. And, and at the start of that conversation, what you'll see Via is I always start with saying, what is the goal of this conversation? Yeah. Are, are we working on being in business together or are we working on a plan to not be in business together? When you're fighting with your spouse, ask the question, is my goal to stay married or is my goal to become divorced? Mm -hmm. I actually do not think there's a middle ground in business or in life. You are either working on being together or you are working on being apart. But if you ask yourself that question before you get in there to yourself, what is the goal of this conversation? What's the goal of this interaction? Am I working on staying married or am I working on becoming divorced? Am I working on getting out of business with this person or being in business? It'll actually change your tone and your emotions, your energy, your questions and your responses. Because if you were really working on staying married, you would not treat somebody that way. If you're really working on staying in business, you wouldn't respond to people that way. I mean, Ben, I cannot, I couldn't agree with you more on that. I, I share the exact same values with you. And I also just want to add to that because, because, it, and I think the reason we talk about conflict, by the way, when we talk about self-regulation is, is the obvious consequence. And, and by the way, you guys, nobody's perfect. I mean, no one's perfect here, it, it, but it's conflict, right? So you have to add conflict when you're talking about self-regulation. 
And I think what's really important, Ben, and uh, what, what we, what I'm conscious of doing certainly with you is um, we had, a, I'm thinking back to, I don't know, two weeks ago, whenever it was, um, when, um, you know, I, I feel very strongly about reassuring you what my intent is. And I think that for all of you guys listening, you know, whether you're the leader or you're, um, you know, you, you, you have a leader, be sure that you tell them this is not an if conversation, it's a how conversation. You know, what I say to Ben a lot is, hey, buddy, we're going to get through this together. Like, I'm not going anywhere. You're not firing me. I won't allow Ben to fire me. And so, you know, like, no one's going anywhere. We just have to figure it out, right? We just have to figure it out. I mean, you, and I just do not think you can reassure that enough. I don't think that the leader can reassure that enough. And I don't think that, you know, what am I, a follower? <laughs> if you're the leader, what am I? the person being led. I, I cannot stress enough how verbally, I think really healthy communication is labeling that. In fact, that brings me to my last point before we move on, and that is labeling. We were talking about it this morning, Ben. So I, I highly recommend a book called The Untethered Soul that um, I read years ago, and then Ben um, had us all read for masterclass. And, and there's this concept that I think is really, really helpful for self-regulation for those of you who um, work under self-regulation like me. We're not quite Chuck Norris's yet. And that is this concept of labeling the emotions. So number one, there are men, there are more emotions than mad, sad, happy. <laughs> Ladies, there might be less than the 150 we, words we come up with, right? So, so we need to kind of think of more words than three. And, and we need to start labeling specific, like, am I frustrated? Am I pissed? Am I, um, am I lonely? Am I, uh, you know, I don't know, whatever. My feelings are, are. Yeah, I'll post, I'll post something, a Harvard Business Review list they have. And, and what I find helpful, which is kind of a, a page from the Untethered Soul, and they actually also mention it in the Harvard Business Review uh, on EI. And that is the concept of saying, you know, hey, um, if I say Ben, you don't know if it's my husband or Ben Kinney, so I can keep saying Ben. Um, so, hey, you know, I, I'm pissed at Ben, right? But, but to label it, I can say, I'm noticing I'm feeling pissed at Ben because he did this. And by labeling the emotion, I'm sort of accepting that it's separate from me. I don't have to feel pissed. I'm saying, I'm noticing that I have a thought right now that's angry about, you know, about this. And so uh, that's really, really helpful. I've had someone describe it as, as looking at a situation as if you have a glass window where you can see and, and hear the situation, um, but you distance yourself just enough to, um, to maintain your control. So. Mm. Really good. I started doing, Ben, I just read that book probably three weeks ago. And I, I went into David's office the, the next time I was in Bellingham after reading that book. And it's like, in that week, every situation, I was, I was able to get into that place where I was like removed from myself almost. And, mm -hmm. and even today, like, if you can step back from those emotions via label them and actually look at them, uh, it's, it's, it's much easier to regulate them. It's, it is. That book is fascinating, by the way. It was a fascinating, Ross told me that it was kind of fuzzy or, or artsy fartsy fairy boy, but it, it's, it's a really powerful concept if you can get your brain to that place. Well, and I they mean, actually I, talk about labeling in the Harbor Business Review book too. It's not so squishy. Labeling is a real psychological tactic. I think I'm on the sixth full time through that book. Yeah, it's tricky. And I've never read a book that many times in my life. And, and I, I'll even just put on a chapter while I'm driving and listen to it and then, and then dig in deeper. And mm -hmm. I'm, I'm on his second book uh, as well, um, which I forget the name of it at the moment, but um, yeah, yeah the, I'm most of the way through it. All right, um, wait, let's move on. We need to experiment going through these. Yeah, the surrender experiment. Thank you, Bob. Yeah. Okay. So motivation. Uh, Via, uh, l let me take this one because mm -hmm. I, I have a lot of thoughts on it. Motivation, relishing achievement for its own sake. There are two types of uh, motivation. There is intrinsic and extrinsic. And what you're looking for is you're looking for people that have intrinsic motivation. Extrinsic is, is when people are motivated by pay raises, time off, bonuses, threat of job loss, gifts, 
contests, that kind of stuff. But what you're looking for in yourself and in other, others is an intrinsic motivation, the kind that comes from within you, the kind that fuels you, the kind that helps you, helps you overcome challenges and, and produce your best quality work or, or allows you to interact with the team members that, that you like and trust. You're looking for that internal drive. And when you're looking to hire somebody into your world, you're looking for somebody that has that. What did they try? And it's a question I use in all my interviews. What have you been number one at in your life? What have you been number one at in your life? And people think, well, you know, are you talking about like a race? No, I just want to know what are you, what are you the best at? And sometimes people will tell you things that nobody else knows about. And that's a very intrinsic motivation. They decided to be best at playing the piano or speaking a language or doing this thing or writing this code or doing that stuff because they care and they're passionate about it. You're looking for somebody with, with high emotional intelligence. And the third factor is a high level of intrinsic motivation. Extrinsic are the people that always want a bigger split, a different pay, more money, right? And that's the only thing that fuels them. And those people you will always have that continual problem with. Everything is always going to be about what you can do for them and how much more you can pay them. Whereas an intrinsic individual, you're going to pay them more without them even asking because they just show up and they're number one at something. So we have to ask ourselves first, what are we motivated by? What can we do to go out there and find things that, that motivate us to produce high quality work? Like here's an example. When, when I put on a class or I'm doing master class, I book a couple days prior with nothing on my calendar. Because I put a lot of time and effort to make sure that when people show up, they leave with more value than they ever thought they would pay for. I want to leave it all on the table when I'm there. And you won't see that same level of passion from me when I teach somebody else's content, unless I am so passionate about that content, like career visioning or hiring, that sort of thing. But when it's my content, and people paid money, or the money is going for a charity, something like that, which all of our events do, uh, I'm extremely motivated. And I'm motivated to produce high quality work, right, to, to overcome a challenge of getting that out there, and it drives me to be the best me. Mm -hmm. So I think we leave that one at that one, but let's move on to the next one because it's something I think really, really lacks in, in a lot of leaders and it takes a lot of work to get there. So talk to us about empathy, Thea. Empathy is understanding other people's emotional makeup and I would add their point of view and perspective. Understanding other people's emotional uh, makeup. And what was the other you added? Uh, perspective and point of view. Understanding other people's perspective other people uh, understanding other people's point of view and here's what i would add to that ladies and gentlemen understanding what else might be going on in somebody's life yeah and before i'll start an exercise like like resentment circles i will say hey let's just take a minute and talk what's going on in your world how are things at home with your with your husband how, how are your kids is everybody okay health wise are you sick how are things going money-wise? How are your savings? Are you guys caught up on bills? Do you have anything else going on in your, in, in your world? Because sometimes I try to solve a work issue when the real issue is that they can't pay their mortgage, they're having a fight with their spouse, they're, they've been diagnosed with cancer, whatever those sort of things. And, and by sitting back and doing that, and by the time they're done explaining what's going on in their world, I'm so much more empathetic to helping them in the business, the job, or the situation that we're in, because I understand. Prior to that meeting, I'm walking in and saying, this little son of a bitch is treating people poorly, and, and he's mean, and nobody likes him. But when I sat down and I got to know him, 
I said, well, this person's working two jobs, working with me, and then he's working at night, and then he gets home and he's taking care of his spouse because she has cancer, and he never came and told me, and he never asked for help. I have to admire him from that, but he's getting no sleep. He's working too many hours and then he takes it out on us. So I have to sit back, understand that. And then I can forgive him for that behavior. I become empathetic. It doesn't mean I'll allow it to continue by the way, but it allows me to start the conversation in a different manner. So the question that you're asking is how can I put on their shoes for a moment, but before this meeting starts, and, and I like to brainstorm and I do this before I get on a call with somebody that's upset, upset. I start thinking about, well, what else is going on in their world? Well, what could be affecting them? Maybe their business is down. Maybe all their pendings fell apart. Maybe they're financially strapped. Maybe they're going, you know, I go through all those things and then I start the conversation off and they want to go right into the issue and I won't let them. I'll make them talk to me. I need to understand what is the real battle I'm fighting. And it forces you to be empathetic and understanding of, of, of that person that you're dealing with. And when you move fast and you're trying to resolve conflicts and issues, issues in a really fast manner, you're not being empathetic. Empathy says I'm willing to sit down and, and take as long as it takes to resolve this issue with that person. Yeah, it's the number one way to diffuse anything is to immediately put yourself in their shoes. Ben, you have this ability to not just be empathetic, but to recognize, I think, I don't know where this comes from, but to recognize when somebody needs that. Like, I, I'm a pretty upbeat guy. I'm in your, you, you know me, right? And the other day, it couldn't have been a week or two ago, you said to me, hey, man, is everything all right? And I don't know that I was like, obviously you felt something from me, right? But it was a chance for me to just say, well, here's here, right? I, I think like Aaron and I had, had, had a fight last night, or whatever it was, right? Um, but just that, that openness to say to somebody like, hey, is everything okay? Like, even if you don't know, like opening that, that channel for, for them to, to, to tell you what's going on, you do it even when there's not a problem apparent. And I don't know if that's like, are you just always kind of in tune with the, you know, with your people's emotions? Well, it's, it's part of the, it's part of the goal of a leader. And that's why a leader can't lead too many people because you lose track of that. So all you end up with is you end up with these little glimpses or moments. Sometimes V is a good example of this. When V is upset, she wears it like a Halloween mask. <laughs> there's, there's no. I, I don't think to other people. I don't know if that's to everybody. To Bob's point, I think it is, but we'll we'll see. <laughs> Maybe it is. <laughs> I I can tell when when there's an issue with Via, and I can see it on her face. Aaron, same way. A lot of my people, when there's something going on, I can tell. Ross, it's our CFO. I can't tell. He's always the same. He's very consistent. He doesn't have high or low emotional expressions. He's, he's probably a little bit more like me when it comes to that. But in addition to that, not just being self-aware, but just being aware of your people. How are they responding differently? Are their messages shorter, right? Are their responses yep. shorter? Uh, what, what do they look like today? Like what, what can you do to, to be aware of what these people are going through so that you can be empathetic and ask them. I know when my normal people who message me every single day, right? When they go a day or two without messaging me, I know there's something gone or something wrong. I have some people that message me every week. And when they go a couple of weeks without messaging me, I know that either I have an issue with them or they, they have an issue with me or they have something else going on in their lives. So it's just a trigger for me to sit back and go and say, what's going on? The next thing you understand is that when you show that you care to these people and you help them find a solution to it, they actually become unrecruitable. If, if you are a part of them accomplishing their goals and then feeling like you care, they're not going to go anywhere because that most likely in their entire career, they've never had a leader they worked with that cared about them. They've always but worked with people that cared about themselves more than anybody else, right? What would you yeah. add to that, Bea? Yeah, I would add, yeah, I would add that um, when, my, when I went through my team uh, breakup, whatever you call it, 
what I, what I realized when I did the autopsy was um, that I'm very, very in tune to what you're saying to pattern changes in pattern of behavior, right? I have a sixth sense now and it's not really, you know, ESP or anything. It's just that um, once, I think once you've gone through it, Ben, you, you, you do develop very, very good. We call it intuition, but it's really micro body language. It's really um, changes in, in a typical communication pattern and behavior is really what it is. It's like that book, uh, Blink by Malcolm Gladwell, right? Where you're, you're just thin slicing and you don't even know you know it. Uh, yeah, uh, for sure. I, empathy is, um, empathy is one of the, I mean, it's going to sound crass, but it, you can hack almost Anything in EI was empathy, empathy self-awareness and empathy are probably the foundations, I think, you know, of, of EI. Because if you do nothing else but put yourself in someone else's shoes, if you do nothing else but that, I almost think the rest follows pretty, pretty easily. So like your one thing as far as your domino would probably be empathy. Would you agree with that? Yeah, if you are naturally not an empathetic person, then it's something you need to work on. And you just come up with a list of questions that you would ask people like, Hey, is everything okay? How are things at home? You also say, you're one of my favorite. Are we good? And then when yeah. they respond immediately, whether you're good or not, they're all going to say, yeah, we're fine. Then you respond with, is that true? <laughs> and, and you just wait for the response. Hey, are we good? Yeah, we're good. Is that true? And you stare at them. <laughs> be willing to be silent and wait for the response to see that you're actually good. Now, Via, talk about social skills. Social skill, building rapport with others to move them in, de in desired directions. What does that mean to you? Well, getting buy-in and, um, you know, making people feel heard, um, you know, showing that you care about them, doing, depositing, I call it depositing. So, it, to move someone in a desired direction, you have to withdraw. You have to withdraw an activity that you want out of somebody because this is a leadership mentoring program. So for me, you know, this is, this is in large part deposits into your relationship to them, spending time with them, listening to them, being empathetic, right? Um, you know, uh, all, all the stuff that we're talking about is what it means to me. Building rapport with others to move them in desired directions. What is your, your personal ability to build rapport with people and how fast can you do it? Can you build loyalty and build a relationship so somebody opens up and, and shares with you? That is a skill and it, it is something that, that you develop over time if you study and if you practice, it's your ability to ask good questions, to follow up, to be empathetic to those people, to listen, right? And people that talk too much and are always telling their own stories and always interrupting. And when, you, and when you're looking at them, you can tell they're thinking about what to say next instead of listening to you or they're on their phone or doing those other sort of things. They have no social skill. I got really into understanding building rapport because I think it's the key to lead conversion. I think it's the key to recruiting. I think it's the key to retention, relationship building. I, in fact, I wrote a class called uh, Persuaded and it was only about building rapport for the purpose of sales, recruiting, right, retaining. Mm -hmm. And a lot of the books that I read, one was um, called Persuasion, uh, fantastic books. And it goes through the different elements of, of, of persuasion and um, how to win friends and influence people. And then even the, the dark arts of cold reading and, and fortune telling and those sort of things, because it, those things are all about building rapport. How can you get people to feel like, right, they can trust you fast? And magicians and fortune tellers and palm readers and politicians and, and big speakers like Tony Robbins, they are masters at building rapport super fast. So yeah. if you're having an issue with your people, maybe you're not building rapport, right, Via? Yeah, and, and it, stems, it stems with asking the right questions. And the example I have is um, one of the best coaching frameworks I've ever had is one that Ben teaches, and it's called um, problem plan, sorry, problem button plan, right? 
And one of my ahas I had, so I've been practicing that for, I don't know, how long has that been? A month, two months since yep. you taught it? Yeah. I've been practicing it out in the field, you know, and kind of um, feeling forward on that. And one of my big ahas, I was reading a book called, um, I don't even think the book's worth it. You know what I'll do? I'll post my notes and I'll post the books on the Facebook group, but I don't think the book's worth it. It's called Power Questions or something. And, and what my aha was is that it's one thing to identify somebody's problem. In fact, I think a lot of us do it really quickly when we're in sales. We're really good at identifying their problem. It is the social skill to get them to identify the problem. <laughs> because it, it's one thing for me to say, you know, hey, Bob, I'm looking at your real estate business and you're 80% you're buyers and 20% listings. Like it's really obvious to me that you need to build a listing business, right? And, and that's a problem. The, the, the challenge is you're happy, you're good, you're making a lot of money, you don't see a problem with it, right? So now how do I get you to own that that's your problem? We miss that link a lot. And so what, what Ben's describing, I love that class persuaded because a lot in large part, it's about asking questions. Yeah. You know, um, type in your aha from today's, from today's session into the chat box. We'll read a few and then type in a few questions uh, with a question mark at the end. Uh, we keep getting people jumping into the chat session and they're asking about masterclass. And I think, we only have a couple spots left. We only do this once a year. Uh, if anybody has ever wanted to be personally coached by me, I don't do that. However, the way that I'm able to do that is we launch Masterclass. And Masterclass is two, uh, it's four full two-day sessions. We start in the morning. We go all night the first night, at literally till 9, 10, 11 o'clock. Then the next day, we go all the way till like five or six. And we do that four different times through the year. So we spend 80, 90 hours together, uh, plus interactions and really uh, unfettered access to me and to our team. It's really expensive. Uh, proceeds are going to solve homelessness in our, in our community here. Um, I don't do this for the money, but if you wanted access to me for a full year and you wanted to tear apart your business and your life and work on things you've never thought you needed to work on, uh, we have a couple spots left and then we're gonna close it down. It's a very small group. There's only about 25 of us. Um, and the first, a lot of the first group are on the call today. So a couple things, Ben, there's only two, uh, somebody's telling me there's two spots left in there. We just posted a link where you can go and, and schedule a call with Josiah. You can talk about it real quick, you know, get the details, what it's all about, when it is. Um, so I posted that link. I'll post it again here. Um, the calendar link, if you want to go talk to Josiah. Uh, about that class. Real, really quick though, if I may, um, I, I've been in master class. I was in the first one and I didn't know what I was getting into. Um, I, um, I, I think I started in a month when, after I started the job. I had no idea. It has been, it has been a game changer. And my, my story about it is the first day. So it's two days in a row. And my first day, I'm like, what, what is this? I, I had no idea what it was. And I, um, Ben, we went through a whole module and by the end of the day, I had such a big aha that I went home to my hotel that night, which was at like 10 at night, like he said, and I completely reworked my recruiting game plan that I was doing. I got such clarity on what I was looking for and steps and a whole bunch of stuff around it. I literally took my calendar and I shaved off a day a week. So in... It, and the first session, the first day of the first session, I shaved off in, in efficiencies a day a week. I gave myself back a day a week in time. And, and I'm not trying to say that, that Masterclass is all about like these efficiencies, like 20%, you know, time back ROI, but geez, I've never had such ROI going into a class, right? And then, then you move into the, you know, the untethered soul and the friendships and the deep conversations. I saw someone here post that um, they're team leaders in Masterclass and, you know, we're, none of us are perfect. I think what's cool about Masterclass is we're all very imperfect together and we're all very vulnerable. It's a very, very safe and confidential space, even for Ben. I mean, we've all shared things in Masterclass that, We'll never get out of master class, right? So I cannot stress enough. When I looked at, I was spending two thousand dollars a month on on an incredible coach. I, I loved my coach at the time, but by pulling back and and doing master class instead, it was actually less money. Yeah. So if you guys have any questions, email Josiah at benkinney dot com, and he'll set up a call and uh, talk to you. But let's take a couple of questions, Bob. You want to uh, walk through? 
are a couple questions and I'll start with the first one because I saw it. Uh, somebody said, at what point do you stop having empathy and cut ties with an individual? It's a really good, really good question. And, and my answer is when you cannot resolve the resentment permanently. Mm -hmm. So if, if resentment is the wedge that causes divorces and breakups and, and business ends and, and problems in business, your job as a leader is to resolve resentment immediately and make it go away. If it continues to come back or it never gets resolved, you have no choice but to cut ties. So it is a mutual job between you and the person to remove all resentment between both parties. And how do you, this is kind of a, a big quite, but what is the, like, what's your best way or your best technique or that best strategy that you use to build purposeful relationships? What is that thing you do that you think is, like, I have some ideas of what I think you do, but like, what is that? What do you think is that thing you're doing that's really building purposeful, meaningful relationships? Well, I want to make sure that all relationships that I have are mutually beneficial. I don't want to be the person that has a potluck and everybody that shows up shows up with a knife and a fork, right? I don't want them to come with some freaking meatballs and some barbecued ribs, right? And some good salads, a fruit salad with that whipped cream and stuff on. I like the whipped cream on my fruit salad. So in my relationships, I ask myself, Bob, I'm open to, I'm open to get, getting to know anybody, but what is the mutual benefit? Are we, and when I'm done with that conversation, am I leaving energized or deflated, right? Are they helping the whole world or is this just a distraction? And I'm very purposeful about that first, who? Now, the next thing is, is that I don't try to have that level of relationship with everybody. So you have acquaintance, right? And then you have people you work with and then you have your friends and then you got your close circle. I'm very blessed that a lot of my close circle and my friends are also people that I work with, but I've been very careful and purposeful about moving people either as my friends into my businesses. Cause I know I can trust them or the people in my business, making them my personal friends. And because of that, you don't see churn in our company. We've had zero expansion teams leave our business, right? You don't see people leaving our world, right? because we have personal relationships with those people. But I don't know what you would add to that, Bob. I, uh, well, I guess maybe, I don't know, maybe I'm in that circle. And so I just, you're, you're, um, you're, you're deliberate. Like, like you make touches, like Via said, you um, make deposits. It just feel very deliberate. And you do it, what did you go? You, I had told you a story about my kid spraying bleach in his mouth, like cleaning supply in his mouth. And like a week later, you got me a bunch of Mr. Yuck stickers, like stuff like that, that is just you know, unexpected out of the blue, but like very, there they are, <laughs> but very intentional, right? Like um, it feels like you're, you're making deposits into that relationship. And it's I know, for me anyway, it's, it's noticed it's, and it's appreciated. You know, and when you make deposits, you get to withdraw. That's when you get to withdraw, by the way. I mean, little things like both Bob and Via bought their, brought their spouse to when they give. Yeah, I, I really appreciate that. Thank you again for that. Yeah, now, and, and now, say, lot, all I'm doing is saving our money for our next uh, um, rental property. That's the only thing that we're doing in this house right now. But, <laughs> you know, it, it's reaching out to your people and say, saying, hey, do, do, you, do you think Aaron would be, would be willing to come to when they give, Bob? You know, via hey, do you think do you think your Ben would would be willing to come to 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 win may give, and making that a opportunity for me to pour into both you and your spouse. By the way, that creates empathy from them to what you're doing in your career and your business because now they understand our purpose, our why, and what we're up to. Mm -hmm. Yeah. It's a great way to get buy-in to bring your spouses into your world, for sure. There's so much talk in here about the resentment circle, the ICU responding to some of that stuff. Like, maybe it makes sense to have Ben Maybe our next one. Yeah, Ben, maybe we'll talk about that for our next one. Another question? How do you, how do you, um, how do you develop empathy? Put yourself in their shoes. 
Well, the, the first thing is you have to be willing to care. Empathy is about your caring for that person. And it's, way I, it's why I came up with the love and results model, because I said that somebody in my world has to, one, get results, and two, I have to love them. And if I can't imagine myself loving that person, they should either not be in my company or they should not report to me. If I will not enjoy spending time with them, I'm not going to pour into them. And I ask myself that question often when I'm interviewing somebody, would I invite this person over to my house for dinner? Would I have them over for Thanksgiving, right? Would I travel with them? Like I ask these questions and if I cannot see myself doing that because of personality conflicts or whatever that might be, I, uh, I won't bring them into my world. Like I don't hang out with people that drink a lot. I don't hang out with people that smoke. I don't hang out with, with people that are talk poorly about their spouse or their children. Right. I don't talk. I don't hang out with negative people. I got a whole list of things that I don't do and I'm not judging anybody. Everybody can do what they want, but I'm not going to spend my time doing it because it's just, it's just not going to give me the results I want in my life or I'm not going to love them. And I don't want to, that's unfair to them, Bob. It's really interesting that you like build a world around you where you don't have to get outside of what you're comfortable being empathetic about, right? Like you would have a hard time being empathetic. I, I don't know, you know, to somebody that showed up to work drunk every day, right? Like you'd have less empathy for them than, you know, something else maybe. So you're like surrounding yourself with people where you can, you can be empathetic to those folks. That's interesting. Yeah, and I'll just add, and I know we have to wrap it. Although I did think, I think I usually say these are hour 15, but um, one thing I wanted to add, I didn't get a chance to, to mention it, but during motivation, right, which was number three, I believe, was it three or four? Three, yeah. Three. Um, one of the things we didn't talk about is values. And I think that, that, um, that a hack, if you will, to understanding what people's, you know, intrinsic motivation is, Ben, is to understand what their values are, right? And, and when we have shared values, I think all of this is easier and better. I think the one commonality with people in your world that I'm getting to know more and more is that we, we all kind of share similar values, actually. And, and some of that's EI, some of that's, you know, it's, it's regard to respecting other people and, and all the stuff we talk about. So, the, so the, the definition, intrinsic motivation can sound a little fuzzy, but values is, is a definition everybody understands, right? And, and values is often, you know, how we put those into words. You know, I, I value uh, a whatever it takes attitude. And I know that at 7 p.m. on a Sunday that I might get a text from Bob or Via or Josiah or any of my top people with a question, an idea, or a thought about business. And they are whatever it takes people. Now, I don't have to have people in my business that are all in like that, but the people that are, I'm going to reward 10 times. They're going to get a 10 times faster increase in income, a 10 times bigger reward when we have big financial situations that happen, when I have opportunities for investments or ownership, they're going to get those things. I value people that are 150% in to what we're doing. The, the, the people that leave at 459, they're not my type of people. They're great and the, and the company appreciates them and so on, but they're not my type. I've never been that type. Yeah, I don't even know what that I, I can't I don't even know what that's like. Are you wearing hey Ben, is your logo Q or whatever? Q U Q? Q U, yeah. It's a it's a it's a it's a sheep. I'm into the conservation of bighorn okay. sheep. Okay. There you go. That was well, a really important question. I hope today was a, a valuable call for you guys. Via, thanks for this is Via's idea to cover this subject today. And I hope you guys jump on the next call and you share with people that this is valuable that uh, those of you that are ready to take your life to a new level, I hope you join us for masterclass and uh, uh, we'll see you in the Facebook group. Do me a favor, go into the Facebook group today and, and to the BKCO leadership Facebook group and post what your ahas were and questions and thoughts. And we'll keep the conversation going there. Perfect. Appreciate Thank you guys. You. Bob, Via, thanks for everything you do. Cheers. Bye. Bye, Bye everybody. Bye.